Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to A Word from the Lord. James Olfer here with you, and we are glad you are with us. Uh, today, we're going to be talking about something that everybody likes, everybody wants, everybody uh, trying to get more of it. Money, money, money. We're going to talk about money. Uh, you say, well, James, that, that doesn't sound like a Bible topic. Well, you know, the Bible says a whole lot about money. And I know everybody's interested in it because I, I know churches don't, uh, they don't miss an opportunity to pass the plate and collect the money. So we're going to be talking about the church, what the Bible has to say about money, money, money. And give you a word from the Lord on what the uh, the Lord's will is when it comes to giving and collecting money and the uses of it. And so that's all coming up here on a word from the Lord, friends. A word from the Lord is brought to you by the Church of Christ that meets at Two Fifty Boulevard in Eden, North Carolina. We meet Sundays at nine a.m. for Bible study, ten a.m. for worship, Thursdays at seven p.m. for our uh, Bible study, midweek Bible study, and if you'd like to be a part of that, just please come on out. Uh, you can reach me at a word from the Lord at gmail.com, a word from the Lord at gmail.com. Uh, phone number is 276 340 2653. That's my phone number, 276 340 2653. You can call that right now if you want, <clears throat> and I'll, I'll pick it up. But if you want to be a part of the program, live program, there's some other phone numbers you can. Uh, call and uh, to be a part of the program. Uh, the area code is 336 on those numbers. Area code 336 427-9696. That's 427-9696. 427-WMYN or 627-9563. 627-9563. That's 627-WLOE. And so uh, if you want to be a part of the program, you can call those numbers as well. But we're glad you're with us and hope that you are ready to study uh, the Bible and, and get a word from the Lord on what God has to say about money. Now, friends, the reason I, I said that way because I know everybody is, is wanting to know about money. Now, how do I know that? Well, one of the reasons that I'm talking about that is because when you look at the, the denominational world, they have their own ideas about how to raise money and especially uh, this time of year winter fall going into fall and winter uh, you have all kinds of, of bake sales and uh, cook-offs and money-making schemes that uh, that denominations use to raise money for example uh, here's one uh, this was in the uh, uh, let's see, this is the, uh, uh, the, the paper, this is the Dan River, Go Dan River, I guess it's the Danville Retro and B, uh, which is also, uh, they cover Eden, I guess, and Regal as well. Stew and Bake Sale by the Fisherman's Club, uh, St. John's United Methodist Church, uh, 11 to 1, uh, on on a given Saturday. It's already passed, so I don't really mind telling you that. But but here they are. So stew is going to be sold. Stew and bake sale for St. John's United Methodist Church. $5.50 a quart for stew. And uh, you can call and reserve your quart of stew if you want. Here's another one. It's an article I want you to read. I want you to hear about, from, about this. This is the... <clears throat> excuse me. This is the... Um, uh, another Methodist church. This is the first United Methodist Church of, of Alexander City. Uh, the article says this is from the, uh, the Alexander City Outlook. It says, I want to read you this, this article. It says the um, members of all three campuses of the first United Methodist Church of Alexander City came together. Now, that right there to ask you want, makes you want to know what do you mean campuses of this one congregation. Uh, they came together to start cooking uh, food for the church's annual Brunswick Stew Fellowship Lunch scheduled for 
whatever that was, Saturday. This is going, this has been going on since 1956. Now, the reason I'm telling you this, friends, is because I want you to see the, the, the tradition that comes to play. When individuals start doing things, if you don't get a Bible verse for it, if you don't have a thus set the Lord for it, then you, you run the risk of doing things and just because you've always done them. Now, even members of the Lord's Church are guilty of this. Oftentimes, they'll start doing things and they have no idea why they do them. Now, they may be right. They may, they may be able to, you may be able to find a book, chapter, and verse for why they're doing what they're doing. But if you ask them, some of them can't tell you why. They can't give you a book, chapter, and verse. They're just, it's just, uh, you know, I guess by God's grace that they actually were taught to do something right. You know, they're just going through the motion. But these things that, that people are doing, raising money, I want you to notice how, how long they go and how they... Uh, evolve, if you will, into these money-making schemes that churches do because that's all they know. Now, this is what they said. They said it's been going on since 1956, said Pastor Mike Dinsmore. It's a family affair. It's all about fellowship. Everyone gets involved. He says the church members began to gather uh, just before 4.30 a.m. Friday morning to begin preparing the food, cooking chicken, pork, and a large uh, iron pots in the church's in the church's cooking shed behind the sanctuary building. Uh, there's, this whole, there's a whole slew of lessons in this article. Just from the terminology, you know that they're not reading the Bible. All right, let's go on. It says, once the meat's ready, they are taken out of the pot into the church kitchen and fellowship hall to be shredded and prepared to be put in the stew with all the other ingredients. Brunswick stew started out using squirrel and other wild game meats I can guarantee you that there is little to zero wild game in ours, Dennis Moore said. We use top-end chicken and pork roast with a secret recipe. And before you ask, no, you can't have the recipe, he added with a laugh. That's one of the most common things we get asked, and we always have to tell them we can't give it out. Okay, so Dennis Moore said there are some things that have changed, but other things have stayed virtually the same over the course of 60 plus years. Back in the day we cooked meat in, the, in black pots heated with fi wood fires. So we had to man them all night keep stirring the pots. With all the modernization uh, on the shed using natural gas we don't have to uh, be here all night. So they've got their own little cooking shed out there. So you can tell this is something that they do on a regular basis to, and uh, it's, it's going to be to make money. It's going to be make money. Uh, at the same time the recipe the church uses has changed very little, and me and the children of the members who started this annual event have carried on the tradition. All right, so they've started this tradition of selling Brunswick stew, bake sale, and so forth. And now you have members of the ch children's member, um, children of members that are continuing on the tradition. Now, friends, I don't have a problem with traditions per se, uh, but. There are certain traditions when it comes to the Bible that we have to follow if we're going to be right with God. Listen to what Paul said. Let's stop here and just, and just put this verse in for a moment. Uh, in 2 Thessalonians 2 and verse 15, Paul says, Therefore, brethren, stand fast and hold the traditions which ye have been taught, whether by word or our epistle. So the, the traditions that are most important are ones that have been taught or passed down from the apostles, ones that have been taught by the apostles, whether by word or their epistle. So the letters that have been written, the, the New Testament, those are the traditions, those are the divine traditions, the inspired traditions that we're to carry on. When you start uh, participating in man-made traditions and neglecting all of the the inspired traditions that, that God has set forth, then you run into a problem like you had in like you have in Matthew chapter 15 where the Pharisees and the scribes came to Jesus and said, "You know why do thy disciples transgress the tradition of the elders for they wash not their hands when they eat bread?" But he answered and said unto them, "Why do you transgress the commandment of God by your tradition?" So, if traditions violate what God said, then they ought to be thrown out. Because what they're doing is they're actually making the commandment of God a little effect. And that's what Jesus said there in, that, in, in the text of Matthew 15. He said, you say 
uh, you know, God said, honor your father and mother, but you say, well, here's a condition, here's a situation where you don't have to honor your father and mother. If, you're, if you say you're doing this for God, then, then uh, you, uh, you get to bypass what God said. I'm paraphrasing there. But he said, thus you have made the commandment of God none effect by your tradition. That's verse 6. So, friends, when we're talking about traditions, we're talking about doing things that are in keeping with the Word of God. That's the most important tradition. But these traditions like stew cook-offs and brunch stew sales and things like that, they have no place in the Word of God. And that's what we're going to talk about as we go on. But I want to get back to this article. Dennis Moore, this, that's the, the, the so-called pastor of the... Uh, 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 First United Methodist Church in Alexander City. He said, um, uh, the lunch of Brunswick Stew has served as a valuable fundraiser, providing the church with much needed money to maintain a number of the various ministries the church offers. However, he said there's also something much more important that comes from offering this to members of the public alike. The key is fellowship with one another. All right, well, the, the, but the bottom line is they're doing it for money. You know, yeah, you can get together and say, yeah, we have a good time doing it. Well, you can have a good time uh, getting together and eating, but when you're doing it for fundraising, then that's where the Bible is going to uh, uh, disagree. You're going to be contrary to what the Bible says. And so what, that's what we're, we're wanting to point out here. Uh, and the reason why this is so important, friends, is because, again, if you start doing something contrary to the Bible... You come up with this idea, well, this is what we're going to do, and then it's passed on, passed on, passed on. People forget why they do things, and pretty soon you're doing them and not even stopping to, to look and see what the Bible has to say about it. And so this is what's so, so important. Uh, he says, with the, church, uh, the article says, with the church having done this for more than 60 years, Dennis Moore said people have had nothing but positive things to say about the Brunswick Stew Lunch Church members make sure there's plenty ready for guests to eat either in the church fellowship hall or take with them. We usually have about 1,500 pints made up for to-go orders, and we have sold over 600 of them already. Uh, we have been taking calls from people as far away as Gadsden, interested in, in uh, getting some stew. Uh, so uh, the first, the annual First United Methodist Church Brunswick Stew Lunch uh, tickets are worth six dollars, and uh, you know for a plate or a pint of stew. So six dollars for a pint of stew. They've already sold six hundred of them. So you know, do, just do a little math. That's uh, thirty-six hundred dollars uh, right there. And, uh, and so it's all a money making. It's all money making scheme. Now you say, well, James, that sounds kind of innocent. Well, let's listen to what the Bible has to say. Let's look at some pre precepts here for a moment. I'm, I'm going to bring up some other things just to show you what we're talking about here. But we have to talk about we have to talk about what the Bible is authorizing, what the Bible commands, or what is given in the inspired traditions of the apostles, uh, whether by word or what they've been taught. We have those in the Bible, so we have to go to those inspired traditions to find out. Well, how do we raise money? I mean, is, is Brunswick Stew a viable option to, to raise money for the church? Well, first of all, and I'm just going to, I have to say this. You know, everybody's going to get tired of me saying it, but I have to say it. Well, first of all, you should go to the Bible to find the United Methodist Church. You know, let's, let's, let's don't worry about collecting money and selling Brunswick Stew for a moment. Let's first find the United Methodist Church. If we can't find the United Methodist Church, then it really doesn't matter if we're raising money for the United Methodist Church. It's wrong. Okay? Even, even if raising, uh, raising money using the Brunswick Stew was right, uh, you can't find the first United Methodist Church in the Bible, so that's wrong. So you're raising money for the wrong church. But we'll digress. We'll say that for another time. But let's notice this. Let's notice what, what the Bible has to say about Raising money, all right, or, or, or raising funds to be used for uh, ministries or carrying on the work of the church. In 1 Corinthians 16, verse 1, uh, if you're taking notes, and I'm, I'm going to try to make this easy for you. If you're taking notes, we're going to talk about the precepts. These are the commands. These are the things that, that, that God has given to us in his word on how to do certain things. Now, this is what Paul says, 1 Corinthians chapter 16, verse 1. 
He says, Now concerning the collection for the saints, as I have given order to the church of Galatia, even so do ye. Now that word order there is a command. It means it means it's you know it's it's a it's a command that, that has been given. Uh and Paul says, I'm giving you this order, I'm giving you this command, and this is the same order, this is the same command that he's given to other churches wherever he's gone. Look in 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 17, back up a few chapters. 1 Corinthians chapter uh, 4, verse 17, Paul said, For this cause I have sent unto you Timotheus, who is my beloved son and faithful in the Lord, who shall bring you into remembrance of my ways which be in Christ, as I teach everywhere in every church. So this is what Paul taught everywhere he went. And so whatever we find that Paul taught everywhere he went, and what do we find that Timothy taught as he is reminding them of what Paul taught, that's what we should be focused on. That's what we should do because that's what Paul taught everywhere he went. Now, let's look again. 1 Corinthians chapter 7 and... Uh, Verse 17, uh, Paul says, But as God hath distributed every man, as the Lord hath called every one, so let him walk, so ordain I in all churches. Paul taught the same thing on different issues everywhere he went. So if these churches are concerned about traditions, they ought to start with the inspired tradition that Paul uh, set forth in the Scriptures. And friends, that's why we're, we're trying to tell you, listen, go to the Bible and find a book, chapter, and verse for why you do what you do. And if you don't, if you don't agree with with something that you're hearing on this program, then what I would encourage you to do is go to your pastor, your preacher, your bishop, your rabbi, whoever it may be, and say, "Listen, there's this guy that's teaching. He's on the radio, and and we I hear him. I'm listening to him. I'm watching him on YouTube's and things like that. And you know, I, I need some answers for this guy. Friend, just call him up." Get, get your preacher, pastor, bishop, rabbi to call up, and we'll have a discussion on that. All right, we're going to go to the phones. You're on a word from the Lord. Hey, James. Hey. How you doing? All right. You remember me? I remember you. How are you doing today? <laughs> uh, I was just listening to what you said. I don't see nothing wrong with what the church doing. Okay. Well, can you and, get... Uh, I, I, what we want to know is, can you give me a scripture though? Can you turn? Can you turn your radio down? I think I think your your volume is getting the feedback. Can you turn that down a little bit? What are you doing? What what you doing? More horn than they're doing. What I'm. Well, now listen. So far, I've given scripture. Now you haven't given any scripture. So why don't you give some scripture back? Well, I haven't said anything about hell today. I ain't never heard you say nothing about hell. Is that what you want me to preach on? Turn, turn, turn your volume down a little bit. Are you listening to me? Listen to me just through the phone. All right, go ahead. Well, I'm, I'm, I'm hearing a feedback here. Turn, turn your volume down. Now, okay, well, give me some scripture on this. All right, give me some scripture. What, 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 what am I preaching wrong? Okay, well, tell me what I'm preaching wrong. I'm waiting on some scripture here. Well, well, listen. No, now, now, listen. Hang on a second. Why, why do you call in to say I'm preaching something wrong and you don't give me a scripture about where I'm wrong? I think you all just start preaching the gospel and telling people that they're going to hell. I know you think that. I, I know you think that, but you ain't giving me any, any scripture. What, what's, your, what's your preacher's name over at Pleasant View? Well, my preacher preach on hell. Okay. What's, what's his name? What's his name over at Pleasant View? What's his name? Okay. Yeah, friends, we, you know, that's that's classic. Uh, I'm, I'm a false teacher, but no one, no one, you know, you don't give me a scripture. Tell me why I'm saying something wrong. But here's what I'm doing, friends. 
I'm going to show you, I'm going to say somebody's doing something wrong, and then I'm going to compare it to the precepts. Let's go to the Bible. Let's go, let's get a word from the Lord, and let's find out what people are doing wrong. Now, he said, Carter said he didn't say anything wrong with uh, what the churches are doing about raising funds or, you know, selling steel, okay? Well, you may not see that, but what I hope to do is I hope to open up the eyes of your understanding with with the Scripture, because that's what we're that's what we're trying to do. We're trying to open up the eyes of your understanding. Uh, Paul said in First uh, in Ephesians chapter one verse eighteen, he says, "The eyes of your understanding being enlightened." So we're trying to enlighten you with the Scripture, open up your understanding so you can know what what the Scriptures have to say. So here's what Paul commanded. All right, again, let's get back to the precepts. Paul said, "Now I have con this is concerning the collection for the saints." Now. This was a uh, this was a collection for of you might say benevolence. Now, what we find in the scripture, we find the the church did a number of things. They did benevolence, edification, and and uh, evangelism. And this particular uh, subject Paul's talking about is for the benevolence for the for the saints. All right, the needy. This is a collection that's going to be made for, for benevolent purposes. So, but at the same time, whatever whatever the church's needs are, this is the pattern that you would use to fulfill those needs. Now, the, the folks selling the Brunswick stew, they said, well, we're going to fulfill those needs by selling Brunswick stew and bake sales. Well, that's not what Paul said. At least I don't think so. Let's listen to the precepts. And let's see if we can find some bake sales or Brunswick stew. I, I don't find the apostolic Brunswick stew anywhere in here, but... You know, maybe you got the scripture. Maybe you maybe you want to call in 4279696 or 6279563. Maybe you've got the verse that talks about Brunswick Stew. I haven't found it. All right. Now, so let's see. Whatever Paul commanded for the church to then is the same thing he's going to command today. If he were here, this is what he would say. Now, let's see what he has to say. He says, upon the first day of the week, 1 Corinthians chapter 16, verse 2. He says, upon the first day of the week. This is now this is when Paul says to lay by in store. So this is how periodic you ought to do it. How, how often should you lay by in store? Well, Paul said upon the first day of the week. Now, the denominations with their with their Brunswick stew sales, they're they're doing this annually. Alright? They've got one time where they're gonna raise funds annually. Now I'm pretty sure that's not the only fundraiser they do throughout the year. They probably have something in the summer. They probably have a car wash and no telling what else. But Paul says that the collection ought to be done upon the first day of the week. So periodically, every first day of the week, that's when Paul commanded, and remember he gave the precept, he gave the order, that collection be taken upon the first day of the week. That's Sunday. Because the first day of the week was the day when the disciples came together to worship. Now listen, in Acts chapter 20 and verse 7, Acts 20 and verse 7, the Bible says that upon the first day of the week when the disciples came together to break bread, Paul preached unto them, ready to depart on the morrow, and continued his speech until midnight. All right? So on the first day of the week, they came together to break bread. Now friends, this was the, this was the Lord's Supper. Breaking bread here was the Lord's Supper. They came together for this purpose. Now, why was that? Why did they come together on the first of the week? Well, this was the day of the week when Christ was raised from the dead. In Acts 28, verse 1, let's just take a little time here to show you the importance of the first day of the week. Uh, Matthew 28, verse 1, In the end of the Sabbath, as it began to dawn toward the first day of the week, came Mary Magdalene and the other Mary to the sepulcher. All right, so it began to dawn toward the first day of the week. Let's look at let's look at a another verse, Mark chapter sixteen and verse two. Mark chapter sixteen uh, and verse and verse two. And very early in the morning, the first day of the week, they came into the sepulchre at the rising of the sun. So it was on the first day of the week. On the first day of the week is when they came together because that was the day when Christ was raised from the dead, and they're remembering his death, burial, and resurrection through a memorial feast, the Lord's Supper, that they were to take every first day of the week. Now, I find it very interesting. Individuals, sometimes they want to, they want to put off the Lord's Supper 
to once a month, once a quarter, once a year. You know, on Easter they'll take the communion. As a matter of fact, uh, I had, had a Bible study one time with with uh, a Baptist preacher was there, and I, I, Easter had not been a couple weeks ago, passed, and I said, uh, now, how many people here took the Lord's Supper on on uh, on Easter? He said, we didn't. I was, I was surprised. I, I thought that'd be the one time everybody took the Lord's Supper, but but no, not for them. So, well, okay, that's that's how they chose to do it. That's not what the Bible says. The Bible says upon the first day of the week. What first day of the week? Every first day of the week. Now, notice, it doesn't say on Wednesday. Paul didn't say on Thursday. He didn't say on Saturday. He didn't say every time you come together. He said upon the first day of the week. That's when you lay by in store. Why? Because that's the day when they were coming together to remember the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ. So the day you take the de the the Lord's Supper is the day you lay by in store. Why is it? Why is it? Ev uh, denominations they'll understand the first day of the week when it comes to to passing the plate, but they don't understand the first day of the week when it comes to the Lord's Supper. You know why? It's because it's where their focus is, they're more concerned about they're more concerned about the uh, the uh, remembering remembering the the dollar rather than remembering the Christ. See that they're more concerned about the money rather than they are the uh, the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ. Now they say that all well, just preach Christ, just preach the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ. Well, they're not real concerned about it because they don't even partake of the Lord's Supper the first day of the week. And the same rules, the same, the same authority that Paul gives for, for the, the Lord's Supper is the same authority he's telling us upon the first day of the week uh, to lay by in store. So collections are to be done on the first day of the week. Now, friends, that's why if you come to any of our assemblies uh, that are not on Sunday, we never ask you for money, even if on, on the first day of the week. We don't ask you for money. We don't ask you for money. That's why, uh, you know, we had the phone lines open, but we never ask you for money. You know why? Because that's not your responsibility. We don't have Brunswick stew sales asking you to come buy stew for $6 a quart. Why? It's not your responsibility. It's not our responsibility. We don't raise money by... Uh, asking the community to fund our ministry. Can you imagine that? Now, friends, I don't know about you. I don't. I don't participate in denominational fundraisers. I don't want their ministry to succeed. If someone says, "Well, you know, are you going to go down to the First United Methodist Church and buy some brothers too?" No. I'm not going. I'm not going to give them money to carry on a propagated doctrine that's not even in the Bible. Why would I do that? Why would I? Why would I get on the airwaves and say the Baptist, the Methodist, or Lutheran, whatever church is not in the Bible? But on Monday, I'm going to tell you that on Sunday, and then on Monday, I'm going to go down and buy uh, uh, buy food from them or participate in their fundraising to help their ministries. That's that's silly. I'm not going to do that. That's why I don't put a you know a quarter in a bucket when the when the Salvation Army's out there dangling. I just, I'm not going to help them. Because they're not teaching the truth, so why would I help them? Not to mention the fact that they're going about raising money the wrong way. Paul said upon the first day of the week. Because that's when they came together. Now, here's something, friends, that you, that you, need, to, uh, you need to consider. When Paul gave the command to lay by and store upon the first day of the week, he did it. So the church could meet a need. Are you with me? So the church could meet a need. That's when they laid by the store because everybody was supposed to come on the first day of the week. Everybody should have been assembled on the first day of the week. Everybody should have, since they're all coming for the, the Lord's Supper, well, when you come for the Lord's Supper, be sure and bring what you've laid by in store and we'll put it in a storehouse. Now listen, 1 Corinthians 16, verse 2. Upon the first day of the week, let every one of you lay by him in the store. Now this is personal. Friends, 
everybody was supposed to participate. Rich, poor, right? You might, you might have had a lot of money, you may have not, not very much money. But here is what the Bible is saying. Everyone lay by in store, every one of you. Now, you can't say, well, someone else is going give, to give more, so I don't have to give very much. No, that's the, wrong, that's the wrong way to think about it. You should give according to you. You laid by in store. All right? You can't, get, you can't say, well, somebody else is going to give for me. Uh, you, have to give, you have to give accordingly. You know, you got one income family, they should give accordingly. Two income families, they should give accordingly. Uh, you know, we, we teach our children to give very young. You know, we give them money, put it in a plate. And uh, because here's why. If you don't teach them young to give, guess what? When they get old, they're going to be stingy too. And uh, I've, seen the, I've seen the plate passed around, and a little kid got money in his hand, and, you know, the, the mom and daddy had to pry the fingers open to, to get the quarter to fall on the plate. Well, you kind of have to do that with some brethren too. But see, if you're following God's precepts on giving, it makes giving so much easier. Because this is something that you get to do. You know, Paul said it's better to give than receive. Actually, he quoted Jesus when he said it's better to give than to receive. But notice, when people are presented with a need, they generally will give according to their ability. In Acts 11 and verse 29, look at this, Acts chapter 11 and verse 29. Then the disciples, every man according to his ability, determined to send relief unto the brethren which dwelt in Judea, which also they did, and sent it by, unto the elders by the hands of Barnabas and Saul. So the disciples, every man according to his ability. Some people may not have the ability to give very much, and some people may have the ability to give more. Well, you should give according to your ability, but it ought to be personal. This is something that you're doing. This is something that you're doing. See, the way God planned it, it's not meant to be a burden. It's not meant to be a burden on anybody they're supposed to give uh, as they determine. All right? As they determine. Um, let's look at 2 Corinthians chapter 8. Let me give you another prince, uh, precept here. 2 Corinthians chapter 8. 2 Corinthians chapter 8, and we're going to start verse 12, I believe we are. For if there first be a willing mind, it is accepted according to that a man hath, and not according to that he hath not. For I mean not that other men be eased, and ye be burdened, but by an equality, that now at this time your abundance may be a supply for their want, that their abundance also may be a supply for your want, that there may be equality. As it is written, he hath gathered much, hath nothing over, and he that gathered little had no lack. So, what we're talking about? We're talking about, Paul says, give so that you can ease someone else's burden, but don't give to the point, he's not expecting people to give to the point that they themselves are burdened. <clears throat> okay? So it's personal. Now, friends, is it really personal for a church to ask people, well, hey, you know, come give to come give to help help my ministry. Come give to help my ministry. No friends. That's not what God's commanded. God does not expect his people to go out and raise money with begathons and cookathons and bakeathons and you know, Brunswick stew and bake sales. That's not what he says. But what he wants his people to do is to give as they have been prospered. Look again, 1 Corinthians 16, verse 2. He says, let everyone even lay by him in store, as God has prospered him. What, what Christians represent, and when I say Christians, I'm talking about members of the Lord's church, the church of Christ. They should recognize that God is the giver of all things. What you have, you have because God gave it to you. James says that 
every good gift and every perfect gift cometh from above. It cometh down from the from the Father of lights, in whom there is no variable in the shadow of turning. Every good gift and every perfect gift is from above. It comes from God. And so this is why when you say, well, this is what I have, no, you just borrowed that. God just loaning that to you. See? God doesn't need anything. God doesn't need anything, but what he does, he wants you to depend upon him for what you need. In Acts 17, verse 25, Paul said about God, he said that uh, the God that made this world and all things therein, seeing he is Lord of heaven and earth, dwelleth not in temples made with hands, neither is worshipped with men's hands as though he needed anything, seeing he giveth to all life, breath, and all things. So he doesn't need anything. He doesn't need anything. He's given everything that we need. So the whole point of giving is so that we don't depend upon ourselves. All right? So you give as you've been prospered. Now, let's stop, let's stop this for, for here for a minute. What we found so far is in 1 Corinthians chapter 16, Paul says that giving ought to be number one up on the first day of the week. That's how often it should be. It's to be as everyone, as everyone has determined, and you are to give as God has prospered you. Now, friends, when you start putting Bible principles to the to uh, what everybody else is doing, you'll pretty so, pretty soon you'll see that what everybody else is doing is not lining up. God never intended for the work of the church to be carried on by these bake sales, fundraisers, car washes, nothing like that. He intended for his his saints to give upon the first day of the week, as they as as they have been prospered. For them to lay by in store, that there be no gatherings when I come. Now, listen to what Paul's going to say here. That there be no gatherings when I come. This was a preventative step. In other words, God expected his people to have in mind, I'm giving so that. When the need arises, it will already be taken care of. I'm giving so that when there's a need, it can already be. It can, you know, we, we can take we can get taken care of. And so Paul was seeking their help. Paul was seeking their help, and if you'll notice in Second Corinthians chapter nine, Second Corinthians chapter nine, listen to what he said. He said, as touching the ministering to the saints, it is superfluous for me to write unto you, for I know the forwardness of your mind, for which I boast of you to them of Macedonia, that Achaia was ready a year ago, and your zeal had provoked very many. Now listen to what he did. He said, I'm bragging about the folks in Achaia. That's where Corinth was. He said, I'm, bra I'm bragging to the folks in Macedonia. That's like Thessalonica and Philippi. He said, I'm, I'm saying, when I go to Thessalonica and I go to Philippi, he said, I'm telling the man, those folks down in Corinth, they was ready a year ago. They're ready. They're laying by a store. They're ready. See that? Yet I have sent the brethren, lest our boasting of you should be in vain in this behalf, that as I said, ye may be ready. He said, but, he said, I've been both bragging on you to these other folks, but I'm sending some folks to check on you so that when we get down there, we go, whoops, you know, you just made a liar out of me. He said in 2 Corinthians 8 and verse 4, he said, Lest happily, if they of Macedonia come with me and find you unprepared, we, that we say not ye, should be ashamed in this same confident boasting. Therefore I thought it necessary to exhort the brethren that they would go before unto you and make up beforehand your bounty, Whereof you had noticed before that the same might be ready as a, as a matter of bounty and not as of covetousness. 
So, Paul said, you, you should be laying by in store, getting ready for it. Now, friends, if a church, and I'm saying a denomination, if they were really following the Bible, they wouldn't have to raise money with bake sales and stew cook-offs because they'd say, you know what, here's a need, we're, we're laying by in store for it. Well, we're already laying by in store for it. We're not asking the money. We're not asking the community for it. We're doing it ourselves. Now, you may you may have some issues with that. You may want to talk about that. That's fine. Give me a call. 427-9696. 427-9696 or 627-9563. 627-9563. Now, here's, here is something else that we need to talk about. The giving, giving, should be upon the first day of the week. And it's done that way for a pattern. Let's talk about the pattern of giving. In 2 Corinthians chapter 8 and verse 5, we just read that. Uh, actually, we read ver chapter 9. 2 Corinthians chapter 8 and uh, verse, verses 1 through 5. Listen to what Paul says. Paul says, Moreover, brethren, we do you to wit of the grace of God bestowed upon the churches of Macedonia, how that in a great trial of affliction, the abundance of their joy and their deep poverty abounded unto the riches of their liberality. For to their power, I bear record, yea, and beyond their power, they are willing of themselves, praying with us much entreaty that we would receive the gift and take upon us the fellowship of the ministering of the saints. And this we did, not as we had hoped, but first gave their own selves to the Lord and unto us by the will of God. So here's what they did. They gave, they gave beyond their power. In other words, and it, was, it, was, it was a burden on them. But here's what we're talking about, friends. God's people gave freely. You know why they gave freely? It's because there wasn't a burden put upon them about how much to give. See that? We just read Acts eleven twenty nine, When the disciples learned that there was going to be a drought, the disciples determined every man according to his ability to give, and that's what they did. Now, when I see these churches having these fundraisers, I know that they are not following the pattern of the New Testament church. I know they're not following the pattern of the New Testament church. Uh, they're carrying on traditions that were started by some man, but you can't find in the Bible. You say, well, James, why does that really matter? Why, why does it really matter? Here's why it matters. Uh, I, I just have a whole list of, of uh, advertisements here. Stew and bake sale. Uh, State Line Baptist Church, stew and bake sale. Stock up on stew, made with fresh beef and chicken. Six dollars a quart. Um, let's see, here's another one. The United Methodist Women and Men of Hickory Grove United Methodist Church is having their annual stew, craft, and bake sale. Uh, homemade pies, cakes, and craft items. Five fifty a quart. Um, here, here's, uh, let's see, I read that one. How about this one? Uh, St. Luke's Brunswick Stew and Bake Sale. Um, here's another one. Stew Sale, Yard Sale, and Bake Sale at, uh, Morrow's Chapel. Now, you say, well, what's wrong with that? Well, friends, here's the thing. If you start breaking the pattern of doing what God said, where does it stop? Where does it stop? There's a, uh, there's a church in, uh, in Eden I pass by. I see it on their sign. They're, they're having a stew sale. I would tell you when it was, and I would tell you what the church was, but that's what they'd want me to do. So I'm not. But my point is, where do they where where do they where do they get this idea? 
You say, well, James, I don't see anything wrong with that. That's what the caller said. I don't see anything wrong with what they're doing. Well, I wish I'd, I, I was going to get ahead of myself by asking this, but this is what I'll ask you. Well, where do you draw the line? I mean, wh where do you stop? I mean, if Brunswick stew, bake sale, maybe some crafts, if that's okay, where do you draw the line? Because here is the Episcopal Church of the Epiphany in Danville. Uh, their second annual English pub night. Join us for an evening of fun with English beer, wine, and pub food with live music. $25. $25 gets you in. That includes a meal. That's fish and chips or bangers and mash. And two beverages. That's beer, wine, or soda. Now, where, where do you stop? I mean, is that, is that okay? Is that acceptable? I mean, this is a fundraiser. This is a fundraiser that the Episcopal Church is, is having. So where do you draw the line? I mean, if, if Brunswick stew's okay, well, if we're going to sell Brunswick, we might as well sell the beer. Right? If we're going to sell Brunswick stew, we might as well sell the bangers and mash. If we're going to sell Brunswick stew, well, we might as well have the beer. Fish and chips. And where, where does it stop? And where does it stop? And you know, if, if you're gonna, because if you're gonna let somebody have have the stew, you might as well let them have the beer. And if you're gonna let them have the beer, what are you gonna let them have next? Right? Next, they're gonna be selling uh, marijuana, I guess. I don't know. Marijuana for the master. I, I don't know what they're gonna be doing. I mean, where do you draw the line again? And don't think that this far-fetched, friends, because that's exactly what's happening. See, when you open the door to anything that's outside of the Bible, this is what you get. And that's why we started off with, with the precepts. You have to go to the Bible and find out what God said to do and how God said to do it. Because when you start deviating, that's what you do. You become a deviant. When you start deviating from what the Bible is saying, then you have gone astray. That's when you sin. Now you can say, well, I don't have a problem with it. Well, you may not have a problem with it, but that just tells me that, have you read the Bible? Because when I read the Bible, I have a problem with it. It's deviating from, from the, uh, uh, from the uh, traditions that have been set forth by the Apostle Paul. Now, see... The Lord planned on funding the work of the church not by gimmicks, not by ice cream, suppers, hot dogs. There's church in Eden, Tri-City Baptist, with Benny Woods. I mean, they're always having ice cream and hot dogs. I mean, I, get, I see flowers all the time. Ice cream and hot dogs, ice cream and hot dogs. Where do you draw the line? Uh, last week we talked about the... Um, Osborne Baptist Church, you know, they have got a prom. We're going to have dancing and everything. Where do you draw the line? I mean, why, why stop there? Why not just have, you know, disco night? I mean, why are you going to stop there? Let's just go ahead and have a cake party, <clears throat> right? I mean, if one thing's good, then everything's good, right? And as far as, you know, $25 for, for beer at the Episcopal Church, well, if if $25 for for, uh, for two beers is good, well, why not, you know, $50 for, for four? I mean, can you go back in? See what we're talking about, friends? We're talking about getting away from what the Bible is saying all for the purpose of making money, fundraisers, ministry, finance our ministry. Why would you finance a ministry that's con in a way contrary to what the Bible is saying? Unless, unless you don't really care about what the Bible has to say about the matter to start with. I mean, obviously, you're not people are not getting a word from the Lord on these matters before they start, <clears throat> or they never would go through with them. So that that's what I said at the very beginning. 
You starting off with a church that's not even in the Bible. That tells me right there you don't really care about what the Bible has to say. You're raising funds for an organization that's not even mentioned in the scripture, so I know you're not concerned about how to raise money because you've shown that you don't care about the scripture. But if you wanna if you wanna follow what the Bible has to say about about raising funds, well, well let's start off with let's get let's get into the right church, but then let's do it the way the Bible says it. In 2 Corinthians 9 and verse 7, listen to this. Every man according as he purposes in his heart, so let him give. Now that word purpose means to choose above, to choose above another, to prefer. All right, so someone is going to purpose in their heart, this is what they're going to give. They're going to give this amount of money and they're going to lay. They're going. To, they've laid it by in store. It's designated for the work of the church. And on the first day of the week, when they assemble, when they come together to break bread, there's going to be an opportunity when they lay by. When they lay that by in store. That 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 makes your giving, you know, thoughtful. It makes it deliberate. It makes it, you know, something that, uh, you know, shows some some uh, uh, some care and concern, really. Um. I, I I say this a lot of times about uh, presents. You know, people give birthday presents, Christmas presents, whatever. And I say, you know, I want to give somebody. If I give somebody a present, I want them to give them a present that shows that I I'm in tune with them. You know, something I think. You know, this is something I think they'll like. Something I, I or I know they'll enjoy. Something I know they'll like. Something they'll use. Because to me, that's more thoughtful than someone said, well. You know, here, here's your twenty-five dollar gift card. Go buy what you want. Now I know sometimes that's what people prefer, and that's I guess that's fine. But uh, and if that's really what they really want, if I'm if I'm asking them and that's what they really want, then that's what I was go I would give them. But uh, as far as giving, it it makes the giver feel better if if they have put some deliberate thought into it, and that's what God wants. God wants some deliberate thought put into this so that you have purpose, that if you have chose above, you've chose, chosen him above something else. Every man according as he purposed in his heart. Now, let me just say this. I'll say this to some, some members of the, of the Lord's church. Uh, if you're purposing in your giving, uh, and you've already determined that's what you're giving to the Lord, guess what? If for some reason you didn't give that, on the first day of the week, you've already promised it to the Lord. So if you promised it one week and then you weren't able to give it, guess what? You ought to do it the next week. Let's say you got sick or you were, you know, out of town or something happened and and you and you, uh, you know, you didn't get to assemble. You already promised that. I guarantee you, the electric company doesn't look at it that way. Doesn't give you the pass on it. So well, you know what? I'm, I I didn't pay that bill this month, but. I promised. I, I I had the hundred fifty dollars for my electric bill, and I was gonna. I promised to Duke Power. You know, I was gonna give it to him. But man, I missed the deadline. So I next month I'll just give him hundred fifty dollars. Next month, no. Next month they gonna hit you for three hundred. They want last month plus this month. See, and if you've already told the Lord this is what you're gonna give, then that's what you should give. See, so if you're going out of town or whatever it is. You, if you've purposed it, you ought to give. That's what God wants. And then God says, 2 Corinthians 9 verse 7, he says, not grudgingly. Now, if you're going to give it grudgingly, God doesn't want it. But not grudgingly or of necessity. For God loves the cheerful giver. Now, friends, God wants us to give, I mean, God's spirit. And they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. So, if we're giving, it ought to be with the right spirit, right attitude, right mindset. Because, you know, God wants our heart. And if and if it's forced, that means you're giving uh, of necessity. And it's not going to be cheerful. So when the preacher, pastor, bishop, rabbi, whoever comes down and says, well, now you've got to give so much. When you've got to give so much, I, I don't want to give that. You know? But I wonder how many people give just because they feel bad if they don't give. You know, man, I, you know, the guy passing the plate, he's looking at me. I guess I better throw something in there. It's like when you go to the store and the cashier says, uh, do you want to donate a dollar to XYZ fund? No. 
Well, you might think about it. Uh, uh, no, not really, not today. I, 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 I you know, I, I, no, you kind of mumbled around. No, no. But if you go, you know what? There, there's something that's that sounds like a good uh, needy cause. I'm gonna, I'm gonna give some money to that. That that's that makes you feel better. You know, you get your change, and you know, you, there's a little bowl there for you put your couple of pennies in case someone needs some. You, what if the if the cashier says? Uh, you know, here's your change. Why don't you put it in that little dish right there so that the next person comes along that needs a few pennies, they can take them. No. But if it's my idea, I'll do it. See, if I get to choose, I'm, I'm, more, I'm more willing to give. And friends, God doesn't want to, He doesn't force us to give. He doesn't want people to feel forced to obey. He wants you to choose to obey Him. See that? So... I mean, it, because if you choose to obey, then uh, you're going to be doing it cheerfully, gladly. Let me tell you, there's a there's a brother that uh, he's a, he's a, he's a very very generous giver, and uh, he he uh, he uh, he always says, you know, I want to make sure the radio program keeps going on, and you know he he's very diligent about that. And I wish there was more more brethren that were that were concerned about that like that. But you know, too many times people say, "Well, you know, I I need this a little more than 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 the Lord needs it." Well, the Lord doesn't need it. But what the Lord needs is that He needs for you to recognize that He gave it to you to start with. He gave it to you to start with. And this is what the denomination don't recognize. If they would simply follow God's plan, they'd have more. You know, if they'd follow God's plan to start with, they would they would have more. In Second Corinthians nine and verse six, Paul says, "But this I say: He which soweth sparingly shall reap also sparingly, and he which soweth bountifully shall reap also bountifully." Uh, you know, if you, if you don't want to do what the Lord says, then you're not going to be blessed like like the Lord says when it comes to your giving. And so, friends, when it, when it comes to things like uh, uh, fundraisers, stew, bake sales, pubs, whatever it may be, it all gets back to people just disregarding what God said on the matter to the very begin with. And it just shows that their real concern is what's really about money. They're treating, they're treating it like a business as, as opposed to, as opposed to uh, pleasing the Lord. For instance, when you if you visit with us, we don't expect you to put money in the plate. We never beg you for money. This this this, um, this programs are all free to you. Anything we give to you is free of charge. You know why? Because we're not in a money making business. We're here to to serve you, to be of assistance to you. And so, friends, consider whenever you see these people raising funds, consider you know is that really what God says? Is that let's get a word from the Lord on it? And like I said, if you have issues on it, you can call me, 276-340-2653. That's my phone number, 276-340-2653. A word from the Lord at gmail.com, a word from the Lord at gmail.com. Friends, I'm out of time. Got about, what, a minute left? And so we we want you to come visit with us, 250 the Boulevard in Eden, uh, North Carolina, Sundays at 9 a.m., 10 a.m. for worship, and Thursdays at 7 p.m. for Bible study. Friends, we... Uh, you know, we're really concerned about you, and we never we never ask you for for a dime. We just want a little bit of your time. And if you if you really have a Bible question, friends, please please call me, text me, email me, carry your pigeon, however you want to get in touch with me, and I'll be glad to sit down and talk with you. It won't be a it won't be a struggle. <laughs> you know, I'm 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 friendly. I won't bite, and uh, it just you know just a matter of Getting in touch with me, let me know, hey, you know, I'd like to ask this question. And ask your preacher. If you want to sit down with your preacher, you have something uh, that you're disagreeing with what I'm saying, hey, get your preacher to come sit down with us. I'll be glad to do that. I'll be glad to sit down with him and you. But friends, remember this. If you're going to uh, uh, be concerned about what God has to say, make sure that you're getting a word from the Lord and you won't have to worry about the traditions of men. Thanks for your thanks for your attention. Have a good night.